Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Danny Rowling case. He is also known as the Gainesville Ripper and the killer who inspired the 1996 movie Scream. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll look at the background of Danny Rowling combined with the timeline of the crimes because he started committing crimes at an early age. Then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. It's worth noting that some of the information available about Danny Rowling's early years came from him. He befriended an author named Sandra London, and she wrote a book about him. Therefore, the level of accuracy about some of the early years in particular is really not known. So starting with the background and the timeline of the crimes. Daniel Harold Rowling was born on May 26, 1954, in Shreveport, Louisiana. His mother was 19 years old. Her name was Claudia. His father was a police officer and Korea war veteran named James. It is believed that his father may have had post-traumatic stress disorder from his experiences in combat, but there's really no way to know that for sure. James mistreated Danny, as well as Claudia and Danny's younger brother, Kevin, with the level of violence intensifying after Kevin was born. James refused to show affection to Danny, believing that it was not masculine behavior. Claudia left James in 1958 for about six weeks, but returned to him after he pleaded with her to come back. In 1962, Claudia left James again, and again, they would reunite. In 1963, Danny would fail the third grade due to attendance problems. Counselors at the school said that Danny was suffering from an inferiority complex with aggressive tendencies and poor impulse control. They indicated that Danny needed counseling, but he never received it. Claudia suffered what was described as a nervous breakdown around that same time. She left James twice in 1963 and once in 1964, returning each time a few weeks later. So this seems to be a pattern. Now in 1965, when Danny was 11 years old, there was a fight between Claudia and James. Claudia caused self-inflicted wounds with a razor and locked herself in the bathroom. James broke the bathroom door down and Claudia was hospitalized. Danny interfered with his father's attack of his mother and he was beaten. That same year, Danny began having a number of fantasies about being violent and sadistic and he started drinking alcohol. In 1966, James attempted to kill Claudia. That same year, Danny ran away after being put in jail for two weeks after he was found drinking, but he returned when he was hungry. In 1968, Danny was looking through a neighbor's bathroom window when James caught him and beat him. On Christmas Day, 1969, Danny, who is now 15, received a guitar and would teach himself to play. He recalled that this was one of the best memories of his life. Later, Danny would claim that around that same time, he started developing multiple personalities in order to cope with the trauma that he was enduring. In 1970, Danny goes to jail after being caught drinking by James. He was arrested again for consuming alcohol in 1971. Later that year, Danny, who had already dropped out of high school, tried to enlist in the Navy, but failed the enlistment test. He then joined the Air Force and was stationed in Florida. I imagine this is not something that the Air Force would advertise, like they wouldn't make a commercial saying, are you a future serial killer who is upset because you can't get into the Navy? Come to the Air Force. Probably not a top priority in terms of recruitment campaigns. Danny wouldn't last long in the Air Force, though. He was arrested for disobeying orders and drug possession. A mental health professional diagnosed him with a personality disorder. He was kicked out of the Air Force but allowed to receive an honorable discharge. After this, he went to live with his grandmother and started attending church, evidently becoming quite active in the church community. Danny would get married on September 6, 1974, and have a daughter in 1975. His wife became increasingly afraid of him as he frequently threatened her. In 1976, a police officer saw Danny looking through a window of another house and transported him home without arresting him. Danny and his wife started having more problems. She had an affair, and he became more violent. In 1977, she filed for separation. The couple would divorce six months later. 
It's after this that we see Danny commit his first assault of a sexual nature against a woman who looked like his wife. When I use the word assault in this video, that's the type of assault I'm referring to. This is something that Danny did quite a bit during his criminal career. In 1978 and 1979, we see that Danny starts committing a number of armed robberies. He was arrested and sentenced to six years in prison. Danny had a turbulent time in the prison system. During his first sentence, he was convicted of another robbery in Alabama, so he had sentences in two jurisdictions. He tried to escape three different times. One of those times, it took the police three days to catch him. He was released from prison in Alabama in June 1984. He broke into a woman's house in November with the intent of committing an assault, but he felt badly about it and he didn't follow through. At this point, he started traveling around the country committing a number of robberies. He was arrested for one of those robberies and sentenced to four years in 1986. After being released in 1988, he returned to Shreveport, Louisiana because it was a condition of his release. They didn't want him to remain in Alabama. He found a job there in Louisiana in a restaurant but was fired for missing too much work. On the same day he was fired, he forced his way into a house and murdered a 55-year-old man, a 24-year-old female, and an 8-year-old male. Here we see emotional reactivity. Christmas Eve, 1989. Danny broke into a house intent on committing assault on the woman who lived there who he had seen before through her window. The woman did not come back to the house, so Danny left after stealing property, including a 38 caliber revolver. In May of 1990, Danny got into a fight with his father. Danny shot him in the stomach and in the head. His father, James, survived, but lost use of an eye and an ear. Danny then committed a number of armed robberies before moving to Florida and assuming a false name, Michael Kennedy Jr. He started camping in the woods behind the University of Florida. August 24, 1990, Danny entered the apartment of two 17-year-old female University of Florida students. He was armed with a semi-automatic pistol and a Marine Corps K-Bar knife. He found one victim asleep downstairs and another upstairs. He attacked the woman upstairs first, assaulting her and stabbing her to death. Then he did the same thing to the victim downstairs. He posed the bodies and showered before leaving. The next day, he used a knife and a screwdriver to pry open a sliding glass door to an apartment of an 18-year-old female. The woman was not at home at that time, so Danny waited for her to return. When she did so, around 11 a.m., he assaulted her and stabbed her to death. He severed the victim's head and put it on a shelf overlooking her body, which he had placed on the bed. Two days later, August 27, Danny attacks two 23-year-old University of Florida students, one male and one female. He made entry into the apartment through the sliding glass door and killed the male. The female heard the attack and went to investigate. When she saw Danny, she tried to barricade herself in one of the bedrooms, but Danny was able to break through the door. He would assault her before stabbing her to death. Danny left the area and the police assembled a task force to catch the killer. They soon identified a suspect. He was a University of Florida student named Edward Humphrey. He had bipolar disorder and a number of scars on his face from a motor vehicle accident. Shortly after, the police realized that he was not the killer. Many people have accused the police of incompetence because of this, but it actually makes sense that they thought he might have been the killer. He attacked his grandmother. He lived in the same building as two of the victims. He was kicked out of that building for fighting, and he harassed neighbors in the apartment complex across the street. So he wasn't doing anything to help his image. Danny robbed a grocery store using a firearm in Ocala, Florida. When he was trying to escape from that robbery, he crashed his vehicle and was arrested. By 1991, Danny would be sentenced to three life terms plus 170 years for several burglaries he had committed. In November, he was charged with the Gainesville, Florida murders when DNA and other evidence connected him to those crimes. In 1992, he was sentenced to another life term plus 30 years for a bank robbery. That same year, he started corresponding with Sandra London, who would write a book about him, as I mentioned before. They announced their engagement in February 1993. Many people have accused London of using Danny Rowling, and people accused Danny Rowling of using 
London, so it's hard to know what was going on there. It could be that they were using each other. Danny initially pled not guilty to the murder charges, but changed his plea to guilty against the advice of his attorney on February 15, 1994, the day his trial was scheduled to start. He claimed that he did not want to face the jury as they looked at the crime scene photographs. This is really an unusual move. The prosecution wasn't offering a deal, so he had nothing to lose by going to trial. The penalty phase continued as it would have if he was found guilty by a jury, so he still had to face the jury after all. There are a number of aggravating and mitigating circumstances that were considered in this penalty phase. Looking at the aggravating circumstances, Danny was convicted of a violent felony prior to the murders. He was engaged in the commission of other felonies while committing the murders. The murders were heinous and premeditated. Looking at the mitigating factors, Danny's emotional age was thought to be around 15 years old. He committed the crimes while under the influence of extreme mental disturbance. He had suffered emotional and physical harm during his childhood. He cooperated with law enforcement in the sense that he pled guilty to all those murders. He claimed to have remorse for his actions. He had a family history of mental illness, and his ability to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law seemed to be impaired by mental illness. When weighing the nature of the crime, including the aggravating and mitigating circumstances, the jury sentenced him to death on April 20, 1994. He appealed his sentence all the way to the Florida Supreme Court. He raised several issues on his appeal, like illegal search and seizure, the fact that the change of venue was denied by the court, incorrect jury instructions, but his appeal was denied. As he was awaiting execution, he pled guilty to the three murders he committed in November 1989. Danny Rowling was executed by lethal injection on October 25, 2006. He was 52 years old. He didn't have any last words except to sing for a few moments. He never apologized to the families of the victims. Claudia Rowling died in 1995 at around age 63. James Rowling died in 2012 at age 81. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Danny Rowling was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and paraphilia. Let's take a look at the alignment between his behavior and psychopathy, as that's tied in with antisocial personality disorder. With factor one psychopathy, this is primary psychopathy, we see that Danny seems to have some grandiosity and more superficial charm than would be expected based on his history. All the other characteristics seem quite clear. He lied pathologically. He was manipulative. He had a lack of remorse, shallow affect, lack of empathy, and most of the time he failed to accept responsibility. He did accept some responsibility, of course, toward the end. With factor two psychopathy, also called secondary psychopathy, the story is pretty much the same. We see a strong alignment with the characteristics, sensation seeking, parasitic lifestyle, a lack of realistic long-term goals, impulsivity, irresponsibility, poor behavioral control, early behavioral problems, juvenile delinquency, a revocation of conditional release, and criminal versatility. Even though a number of characteristics appear to be endorsed across both types of psychopathy, the alignment with factor two psychopathy is a bit stronger than what we see with factor one. Now looking at his personality profile, I conceptualize personality using the five-factor model. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So with openness to experience, his level would be high. He had a lot of fantasies, albeit destructive ones. He had an appreciation for the arts, namely music, and he was intellectually curious. His IQ was somewhere between 110 and 115. Now IQ and intellectual curiosity aren't the same thing, but they are positively correlated. Looking at conscientiousness, his level was probably as low as somebody could get. He was not organized, and he had no self-discipline. With extroversion, his level would be mid to high. We don't see much in the way of positive emotions, but he was assertive and sensation-seeking. Like many with psychopathy, he appeared to be friendly and outgoing. With agreeableness, his level was low. We don't see any empathy. He did not follow the rules. He was not straightforward. And then with neuroticism, we see his level here is very high. He was depressed, anxious, vulnerable, angry, and had no ability to postpone 
gratification. With all this in mind, with the psychopathy and the other personality characteristics, the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis is really not a surprise. His behavior seems to align with all seven of those symptoms. The borderline personality disorder diagnosis is not as clear, although, again, he was given that diagnosis. Assuming that he endorsed all the symptoms, which of course we don't know for sure, we see that with the first two symptoms, frantic efforts to avoid abandonment and an unstable relationship pattern, they were probably based on his relationship with his wife. The other symptoms seem more clear. Identity disturbance, impulsivity, suicidal behavior, emotional dysregulation, a chronic feeling of emptiness, inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, and paranoid ideation or dissociation. With this last one, it was probably based on his self-report. They may have connected his claims about having multiple personalities with dissociation. When looking at the expert testimony during the penalty phase, we see that all of the experts said he did not have multiple personalities, even though he claimed that an evil persona named Gemini took over his mind. What's surprising here is that the mental health professional for the defense said that Gemini was not identified even under hypnosis. Often in these trials, there's the sense that the prosecution experts say something that will favor the prosecution, and the defense experts say the same thing in favor of the defense. So when a mental health expert for the defense doesn't support the defense story, that's pretty bad. It does make it seem like Danny was lying. The case of Danny Rowling supports the idea that serial killers are created by maltreatment and because they develop a dysfunctional way of relating to women. I think this also highlights yet another danger of domestic violence. There are many victims created by this type of crime. During his series of murders in Florida, with the exception of one male victim, all of his victims were white, petite females with brown hair and brown eyes. He had stalked each of them, selecting them carefully. His attacks were not random. So for Danny, it wasn't just about women in general. He was acting out of a fantasy against women with certain physical characteristics, like he was trying to get revenge against one person by killing other people. Danny Rowling was a bit like Ted Bundy in that way, and with the frequent escapes from custody. He was also like a number of other serial killers. He had a history of maltreatment, substance abuse, and criminal behavior when he was very young, like Carl Panzram. Also, they share the numerous escapes from custody. His behavior was similar to the disorganization, sheer violence, and substance use we see with Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. He used the tactic of claiming to have multiple personalities, just like Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler. He was active in a church community for quite some time, like Dennis Rader, and we see a pattern of escalation similar to that of James D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. In a way, Danny was a less disciplined and less organized version of D'Angelo. Danny Rowling's life was really a life of experiencing and creating horror. In this way, it makes sense he was the inspiration for a horror movie. With his history, it's not hard to imagine how he developed into the Gainesville Ripper. So those are my thoughts on Danny Rowling. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.